Hi there, thank you for joining me this lunchtime. I hope you've had a lovely weekend. I spent mine in the company of Laurie Hartman and his wife Susan. Uh, they were running a minimal leverage masterclass here at the Academy. Absolutely fantastic, as always. And they're back again in June. Uh, the course is already booked solid, not surprisingly. Laurie tells me that we're now the only organisation in the world where he runs any courses, which I have to say is, is pretty damn flattering, given, given how famous he is. Um, but we haven't set any dates for courses with him later this year. So if you're interested in coming along to one of those, just drop us a line. Give, send Ellie an email. The email address should be on the screen at the moment. Uh, and let us know. Um, personally, I don't think you can attend enough of his courses. There's always a degree of finesse that you pick up over the two days. So uh, you know, just get in touch and we'll schedule something if there are enough people showing interest. Looking at today's show, this is a bit of an edgy topic, I think. We're, we're going to be talking about advice that you can give to patients regarding cancer prevention. And I say it's edgy because, you know, we're constantly being told to keep within our professional remit and ensure that everything we do is evidence-based. And we want to avoid the complaints, of course, that might arise if we do otherwise. Well, my guest today is Dr. Shireen Kassam, who's a consultant haematologist at King's College Hospital in London, and she specializes in lymphoma and has a particular interest in the prevention and reversal of chronic diseases through nutrition. She's also one of those relatively rare beasts. She's a certified lifestyle medical practitioner. So obviously in her position, like us, she's got to be perhaps even more careful to ensure that the evidence supports what she says to her patients. Um, so you can really trust that the information she gives us today is safe, it's well-founded, and it means that you're going to be able to share it with your own patients. So Shireen, it's lovely to have you with us today. Thank you for, for joining us. Um, Thank you very much for the invitation. I've, I've had a couple of your colleagues on the show before, or people that you know, um, doctors uh, Neetu Bajikal and her husband Rajiv Bajikal, uh, both of whom are also board certified uh, lifestyle medical practitioners. But I suspect that people watching might not have seen those shows. Can you tell, just remind me, tell us all about, a little bit more about what it means to be lifestyle medical practitioner trained? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, so it is actually the fastest growing medical specialty globally. It was born out of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine that formed in 2004. Um, but something happened in 2015 where it went global and we had the forming of the British Society of Lifestyle Medicine. And since about that date, globally, there's been a certification program. Um, now, just to go back to your question, lifestyle medicine pays attention to what is considered the root cause of the majority of chronic conditions we face here, certainly in high income countries um, where it's estimated that 80% of what we see in the National Health Service, for example, could be prevented or um, significantly delayed if we paid attention to healthy lifestyle habits. So lifestyle medicine practitioners make use of behavior change to embed healthy lifestyle habits such as healthy diet, regular physical activity, restorative sleep, healthy relationships, um, uh, avoiding toxins and now I've forgotten one what's the sixth one um, it's going to be um, a mental health and, and wellness so psychological right. so this and is wellness. this is what we would probably think I mean for years we've talked about ourselves being holistic practitioners a term which I don't like because I think it's it's one of those abused terms where everybody calls themselves holistic but we try to do that we try to apply that biopsychosocial model to care um, it ought not to be new in conventional medicine did it, but it would seem that maybe it is a bit new. Is it accepted, or more and more accepted across the NHS that it's a good way to go? Yes, I, I think it is. I think in terms of what we're writing and policy and what people want to do, you know, improving public health, it is it is very much accepted. You know, we hear about how, you know, unhealthy diets and physical inactivity is causing so much ill health. I think the trouble we're facing is that um, what we talk about, what we put in policy is not um, supported in the actions we take and very much the NHS, um, the medical curriculum is very focused on, you know, um, sort of sticking plaster approaches, treating diseases that have already occurred when we know something like cancer will have started, you know, decades before it becomes a clinical um, clinical problem. And as you rightly say, this is an evidence-based approach. It's a common sense um, approach, but actually we've moved so far away from this common sense approach to healthcare that it's required a brand new specialty. 
Yeah, yeah, and, and common sense sometimes doesn't actually um, bear out what the evidence shows us, I suspect, because lots of people think instinctively that things are good for them. And, and you know, at the beginning of the show, I said that, that talking about this sort of topic is quite edgy. The only complaint I've had made against me in my medical career is because I recommended people read a book by Professor Peter Gorcher about breast cancer screening. And an osteopath who is also a med medical GP uh, complained that I was putting women's lives at risk by recommending that people read the evidence. And, uh, you know, because it is counterintuitive, it, it goes in the face of evidence. So uh, the other thing I, I read in uh, one of the articles about you that I looked at online, that you also, your PhD, which seems a bit greedy, you're a medical doctor and you've got a PhD to me, but uh, your PhD was about looking into the role of selenium in sensitizing uh, cells to chemotherapy. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't see the outcome of that study. So what, what, what was your finding? Yes, and we've had a couple of um, papers published, but you're right, it didn't get to the stage of sort of clinical trials for a number of reasons that probably needs a, another interview. But basically the premise of my PhD project was that um, selenium at supranutritional doses. So this isn't, you know, what we get from our Brazil nuts. It's sort of, you know, five times the dose um, or concentration that can sensitize cancer cells to chemotherapy whilst protecting normal cells um, from the toxic side effects. So it all sounds a bit too good to be true. And certainly in the laboratory setting with cell lines, I was looking at lymphoma cell lines. Other researchers in America had been showing exactly the same in colorectal cancer. Um, it seemed to really do that. Um, you know, we know selenium as being an antioxidant, um, but somehow it was creating um, toxicity in cancer cells whilst protecting normal cells from this, um, you know, same toxicity. Um, but when it came to putting it into clinical practice, it's really hard to um, get nutraceuticals into the clinical trial space for the reasons that I'm sure you'll um, recognize, you know, it's big pharma that's funding all these studies and yeah. nutraceutical companies just don't have the um, budget. And, it, and it's a shame. But to be honest, it, st it started me off on my journey of nutrition and understanding how fundamental yeah. it is. And ultimately, I do think that we our focus of nutrition should be getting our nutrients from food wherever possible. And, you know, yeah. leaving this up for, for when it's not possible for whatever reason. Yeah. I mean that does, that does sound very disappointing, actually. That you know you could, if you can enhance the effect of chemotherapy. I don't know whether that means you just get a better outcome, or whether you can um, reduce the doses of drugs that people have to take. But either way, it sounds as though it would be good for patients, and it would be worth doing the proper um, full trial on it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And to be honest, the story is very similar with something like curcumin. So, you know, if in your PubMed search, you substituted, you know, selenium for curcumin, uh, there'd be all those same lab based studies. But, you know, we're, we, we're never going to get a study of curcumin in, in combination with chemotherapy. It's the sad state of affairs, really. Yes, and I have a couple of friends, colleagues, who only recently have gone through chemotherapy. And given the distress it causes, we, you'd think we'd be trying very hard to find ways to minimise that stress. Anyway, um, we could. I, I often feel that just because we're osteopaths, chiropractors and so on, that we are instinctively inclined to blame big pharma for everything. So it's quite nice to hear somebody from the, the conventional side of the world also um, <laughs> acknowledging that. Um, you're a haematologist. Your specialisation is lymphoma, but um, we chatted a week or so ago and you obviously a lot of what you know is related to other forms of cancer. Um, tell us what it is that you found, the sort of stuff that we might be able to pass on to our own patients in terms of advice. Yes, I mean, I think what brought me to focusing in on sort of um, prevention and um, uh, improving survivorship for my patients was that, you know, more and more I'm seeing my patients with lymphoma, who often do very well from the cancer itself, um, have other comorbidities that are hampering the treatments I can give them and therefore the doses that they can receive and their future sort of, um, you know, survival essentially because they're at increased risk from some of the treatments that we're giving them but also because of their preconditions um, that they have of um, cardiovascular disease, second cancers, type 2 diabetes. And we know this in general. Um, but going back to your 
question. I mean, it's embedded in guidelines for, for decades now, but the most recent guideline on cancer prevention comes from the World Cancer Research Fund in 2018, which really has nine recommendations for cancer prevention. Um, and if we were to all, um, you know, uh, adhere to these recommendations, um, it's thought that four out of 10 cancers could be prevented, which is pretty huge given that cancer incidents, particularly in low and middle income countries, are on the rise. Um, so, and of course, you know, smoking, unfortunately, still remains the top cause of cancer globally and in the UK, but it's soon being caught up with, you know, um, carrying excess weight, which is a it, which is a problem we're facing in all our practices. Um, not any eating enough healthy plant foods and not enough fiber and fruits and vegetables, physical inactivity, unsafe exposure to the sun, um, and um, uh, unsafe um, alcohol consumption. And I would say that there's zero safe level of alcohol consumption when it comes to preventing cancer. Um, so all in all, if we were to put this into practice in our you know, populations, in our communities, for ourselves, um, then you would significantly reduce the risk of cancer. And this has been borne out in you know, um, long-term prospective studies. So that's what I talk about. And because I'm particularly interested in nutrition and everyone asks me, what can I do? What should I eat? What about supplements? And it's nice to be able to give an evidence-based answer to this. And the prevention guidelines really do um, recommend a diet that's predominantly centered around fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans, nuts, and seeds. So all the healthy plants foods that we're familiar with being healthy that are full of nutrients um, that protect us against cancer and support us to recover better um, from chemotherapy radiotherapy and prevent those other chronic conditions that are so common in people who've had a diagnosis of cancer. You talked about prospective studies there and of course we're very used to to seeing you know, randomised controlled trials, placebo, randomised placebo controlled trials and so on over a specific intervention, given that there are lots of different sorts of cancer and given that cancer develops potentially over many, many, many years, um, just how good are those trials and how much of it is an observational thing rather than actual meaningful evidence? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question to discuss, really. I mean, I think with any nutrition study, we have to look at the complete body of evidence to really come to the kind of consensus guidelines. And we have all of that, you know, from the large perspective observational studies, and then, you know, by definition, these randomized studies are going to have to be small because you have to very much control what people are eating and make sure there's no other differences between people mm -hmm. and you have the resource, the finances to keep such a study going for a long time. But we do have these small randomized studies and maybe we'll talk about this in the context of early cancer. Um, and then we have mechanistic data, you know, in the laboratory um, that shows us why such a, a, you know, a diet centered around healthy plant foods is good for us. Um, and then we have numerous um, studies to bring together in systematic reviews and meta-analyses. And that's exactly what the World Health Organization Organization and the International Agency for Cancer Research did with regards to red and processed meat. Um, it looked at the whole body of evidence, more than 500 studies to come to the conclusion that processed red meat is a cause of cancer and red meat is a probable cause of cancer. And, and that's the kind of way we analyse data in all aspects of, of healthcare, mm. really. Yeah, I guess I'm assuming that they've... Um address the confounding factors in that, that red yeah. meat eaters will probably have lots of other lifestyle characteristics in common besides just their food. Yeah, absolutely. And that's what the, you know, the statistical analysis is, is there for. And once you mm. keep getting the same result over and over again, you can have some level of, of confidence in that. You know, you could say the same about smoking and lung cancer. I think everyone's quite comfortable with telling patients that smoking causes lung cancer. But actually, there's no single randomized study and it would lo no longer be ethical to do so. But it took over 500 studies before the yeah. Surgeon General announced in 1964 that that smoking causes cancer. So, um, you know, it's a similar story. Um, and so we shouldn't reject these well-conducted observational studies where we've learned a lot. The same can be said for trans fats, for example. It wasn't a randomized study that showed us that. It was the accumulation of observational data and, and good mechanistic yes. um, uh, corroboration. Yeah. I mean, 
I suspect that a lot of people in your profession will share my slight lack of sympathy with people who deliberately put nicotine into their lungs and then develop diseases. I mean, obviously, I, I wouldn't wish those diseases on them, but nobody is, any, is in any doubt that smoking is likely to cause some nasty disease. Um, is the linkage between, let's say, red meats and cancer as strong as it is between smoking and cancer? So the strength of evidence is just as strong. It's just the individual risk is less. Right. So, you know, smoking gives you a 20 fold increase in your risk of developing lung cancer, um, whereas eating um, processed red meat will probably um, uh, increase your risk over a lifetime by about 18 percent. So, you know, these are all um, relative risks. It doesn't really mean anything. But but if you think yeah. about um, the fact that um, it's about it increases, um, it means that one extra person per hundred will get bowel cancer. So in a population of a thousand, we'll get 10 extra cases. And then you can multiply that so much so that, you know, in the UK, 13%, one, three percent of colorectal cancers are estimated to be due to the consumption of processed red meat, which is around five and a half thousand cases. If you add um, red meat to that, that increases it to 20% of all cancers. And that's it's sort of in the 8,000 cases yeah. per, per year. So not insignificant. But yes, your individual risk is not quite the same. But the strength of evidence in the studies is just as strong for the WHO to declare yeah. it a class one or group one carcinogen. Okay. Um, Jason has already sent in a question. He's asking whether sugars, and I suppose by that also carbohydrates, are a fuel for cancers. Are they a problem? So I think this is a common question and uh, commonly discussed um, online and, and what have you. So sugar d doesn't cause cancer in, uh, from my review of the evidence. You know, every cell in the body requires glucose for fuel. So Yes, cancer cells also require glucose for fuel. I think the trouble comes when we have um, sugar mainly in ultra processed foods or drinks that contribute to weight gain and other chronic conditions such as cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. And these chronic conditions themselves, because of the shared underlying mechanism of inflammation and gut dysbiosis and so forth, all also give rise to increased levels of cancer. So the studies that have, have occurred in the last sort of four or five years, we're getting a sense from observational data that the consumption of ultra processed foods, which are obviously heavy in sugar, but also salt and saturated fat, increase the risk of cancer for um, a number of reasons. So um, for me, sugar doesn't cause cancer, but it is contributing to increased comorbidities. And because it's an ultra processed food, they may well be a direct cause of cancer. Yeah, this possibly sounds like a silly question, um, but comorbidities and in, and in particular diabetes, is your risk of cancer increased because you have diabetes, do you think, or is it just your risk of disease is high and therefore you've got both diseases? Is there, is there any sort of link, causative link? Yeah, um, I think um, uh, both are true. But what we do know, again, from observational data, and there's one particular study that was published in the last couple of years from the Nurses Health Study, so the Harvard observational studies, basically showing in the first eight years after a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, um, people were at increased risk of cancer and this is likely because your pancreas is still working a bit you've got insulin resistance you're chucking out loads more insulin than you should do in order to get that same effect on your glucose mm -hmm. levels and we all know that insulin is a growth factor so you'll also possibly remember studies where in type 2 diabetes um, researchers tried to really tightly control people's glucose levels by giving higher doses of <coughs> insulin and actually it didn't improve outcomes and it increased the risk of cancer. So there is a direct link, but I think there's also a link because of those shared mechanisms of chronic conditions, which you know involve cellular injuries through oxidative stress and inflammation, gut dysbiosis, and of course, you know, the changes in gene expression, so epigenetic changes. Right, thank you. 
Um, I, this, I have an interesting question from someone at the Cranbrook Osteopathic Practice. And I don't have a name for whoever it was that sent the question in. Um, but they said that they have a patient who has high B12, which is not a problem I've actually heard about before, because normally the problem is low B12. Um, they've got normal bloods. They don't supplement with B12. They eat, a, in inverted commas, a normal diet, which I presume means an omnivorous diet. Um, and they've read about a link of high B12 with cancer in the long term. Um, and do you have any information or any thoughts about that? Yes. Yeah, so, again, um, an interesting um, question, which, I'm, which may not have an absolute answer. So, in my profession, seeing people with high B12 often occurs with myeloproliferative neoplasm, so chronic myelocytic leukemia or the other myeloproliferative neoplasms like polycythemia. So, it's a consequence of the high turn cell turnover and the increased neutrophils and, and so forth. Um, but if the person has a completely normal blood count, then you can pretty much exclude an underlying myeloproliferative disorder. So, that's all well and good. Um, obviously, we store B12 for you know more than three years in the liver. So at one point, if you've had supplementation in the past, stored up lots, it may still be high. Um, of course, we don't know how much we're getting in food necessarily. You know, animals are supplemented. We eat the animals. Um, it's various amounts, and I think you know there's so many factors um, uh, with absorption as well that we don't measure and difficult to to realise. But I don't. It's not not uncommon to be honest it's often because people have supplemented in the past I appreciate if this person hasn't then I don't think I'd be overly worried about it there's been um sort of at least one um sort of associative study or observational study suggesting that high levels of b12 are a cause of cancer but from memory that study had some flaws and we're very far away from thinking this is an mm. actual causal relationship um so I personally wouldn't worry about it too much avoid supplementation if the full blood count is normal uh, and there's no liver dysfunction that would be the only other thing yeah. then um i think i would probably not worry about it too much um, I guess I'm glad that you are familiar with all these um, small random, small random stu uh, studies because it's a problem we all face, isn't it? A patient comes in and they've seen something on the internet somewhere which shows a link between this and that. And of course, it'll be some small, badly conducted observational study with all sorts of flaws. But the things that get picked up are controversial opinions and supposed findings, aren't they? So hopefully, yes. that's, hopefully, that's, hoped, hopefully that's helpful to Cranbrook osteopathic practice. Um, Vlad has, um, has said emphatically, Nic nicotine releases dopamine in the brain, so a lot of people with depression are self-medicating with nicotine. It's the other chemicals that are killing us. I think nicotine does have a role yeah. though, doesn't it? Um, not that I'm aware of it. It's mostly the, the, um, the, it's not the nicotine. Nicotine's addictive um, and, and the rest of it is, is all the carcinogen chemicals. Um, and oh. I guess just to say that, you know, our lifestyle choices, in, in inverted commas, may not always be choices. And we know how the, the tobacco industry has just um, essentially moved the problem from high income countries with all this sort of legislation now to low and middle income countries where rates of smoking are, are rising. And, um, you know, we all fell for it back in the 50s and 60s, you know, women's liberation were, were, were advertising uh, smoking. Um, and equally, you know, it's the same with our food choices isn't it it's not always a, a choice um so um yeah but yeah the nicotine's addictive the rest of it's causing yeah. the cancer and hence the, all the other devices that that are sort of tobacco free and well not tobacco free yeah. but um you know have the nicotine but not the other chemicals well back in the 1950s if i'd been alive then um and if streaming had been available i'd have been conducting this interview with a hematologist with a cigarette in their hands i'd have thought because <laughs> well exactly doctors, doctors virtually advertise cigarettes for the, for the companies yeah that that's right so yeah. um yeah exactly Carol doctors has... also eat processed red meat sorry i should i should yeah. point out and it's served yes. in our our stock canteen every day so um carol has, has asked if you can define what is meant by processed red meat yeah, I mean, it's a it's a meat um, that has undergone certain chemical and heat treatments, um, and particularly, it has had preservatives such as nitrates and nitrites, which are there to prevent botulism. Um, so it's things like bacon, sausage, any deli meat. Um, so you know, our kind of <laughs> ham slices, turkey slices, those sort of things. Um, 
uh, yeah, so I mean, I think in the UK, it's mostly bacon, sausage, deli meats would fall under those. Um, but right. it, it's it's the nitrates and nitrites that particularly get converted in the gut to nitrosamines that are then the cancer causing agents. And then the follow on question everyone asks always on my course that I run on plant based nutrition is, well, what about the nitrates in vegetables? No, they don't get converted to these same N nitrose compounds. How is that? They, just because they're yeah, different nitrates? No, well, just because they come packaged with, you know, nature's uh, protectors. So it's the antioxidants like the vitamin C and the lower protein content compared to meat. Um, so, you know, you'll hear some people saying, well, it's fine if you eat your bacon with your green leafy vegetables, there's reduced production of nitrosamines. And it's true. So, um, yeah, it's all the other package that the healthy plant foods come in um, that right. mean that you don't fall the, the uh, um, toxic nitrate compounds. Right. So bacon and broccoli is better for you, but better without the bacon. Yes, and we know most people are going to be having it with their white bun and ketchup and what have you and chips. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, yeah. Uh, earlier on, uh, Ben sent in an observation. He says that what you've said so far sounds very much like what uh, Dr. Ranjan Chatterjee has been teaching or promoting for years on his Doctor in the House show and a podcast called Feel Better, Live More. Um, if it is, then this approach makes so much sense. Um, he says common sense, um, a common sense, natural approach to wellness. Is that, are you familiar with uh, Ranjan Chatterjee? Yeah, 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 no, Ranjan is fantastic and he also promotes, uh, you know, predominantly plant-based with all the lifestyle um, uh, habits or behaviours that contribute to good health and he's been a great advocate. I guess he's been ahead of his time really in that, uh, you know, the qualification and, and the rise within the medical profession in the NHS has taken place a bit later than his um, start to this. So, yeah, he's a great advocate of what we now call life medicine. Okay, so when I send out my follow-up message, I shall put some links in to Doctor in the House and the uh, and the podcast, Feel Better, Live More, mm. because that would be useful. We've had some early flattery has come in as well, um, Shireen, because Cranbrook Osteopathic Practice, still not telling me their name, but they've said, um, <laughs> you, the patient, I think they're talking about the patient who says, they say really knows her stuff. And we knew about the study, but not the liver keeping it for potentially three years. Uh, but anyway, um, they're, thank they're thanking you because they will now sound su supremely knowledgeable as a result of what you've told them, which is, which yeah, is that's what great. we want, isn't it? We want to be confident and knowledgeable <laughs> in front of our patients. Um, yeah. And Chris has said that he works with a herbalist who provides fantastic support to patients undergoing chemo. I, I, I imagine that you know quite a bit about medical herbalism, uh, Shireen. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't. And that's under another branch of oncology, which is really integrative oncology. And you might want to invite somebody um, from that field in the future. I can recommend somebody after the show. Oh, um, please, yeah. So, yeah, so just in the last 12 months, we've had the founding of the British Society of Integrative Oncology, which brings together lifestyle medicine, complementary alternative um, practices that are going to support people going through a diagnosis of cancer, but of course, you know, um, spending a lot of um, energy on prevention um, as well. Um, and yeah, so that that requires a different um, uh, expertise to what I use in my clinical practice, which is very conventional, I'm afraid, and we're still stuck on all the, the conventional chemotherapies and immunotherapies that the NHS has to offer. But if a patient came to you and said, I'm seeing a medical herbalist, would you say, good for you, keep it up? Or? Well, I mean, I would want to obviously make sure that they were also practicing within the guidance of integrative oncology. Um, and, you know, um, I think, you know, there is there are recognized bodies within the, the UK, but I don't have a problem with it. But I, I think, you know, each individual case needs to be looked at because there are interactions between anti-cancer treatments and um, you know, high doses of herbs and, and other nutrients. So, um, you know, just something like green tea will um, interfere with one of um, the drugs we use in myeloma, for example, and even high doses right. of curcumin with cyclophosphamide. So I think it does take care and we, we use our cancer pharmacologists um, to, to advise us on, on specific herbs and things. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that you talking about green tea there reminded me of um, a particular patient that I know who has been through um, chemotherapy and radiotherapy and has become a green tea addict. 
Um, does green tea, outside where it might interfere with a current drugs programme, does it have a role in helping with cancer? And of course, part of your specialisation is, or your interest, is in the reversal of chronic diseases. So to what extent can it or other things help to reverse the process? Yeah, so um, I think most of, well, two questions there. I think green tea is really healthy um, and there's so much supportive data for sort of three to four um, cups of, of tea a day. It's been, you know, used for, for centuries, hasn't it, in, in the... Yeah, um, but it tastes Asia horrible. Stage. Oh yeah, well to be honest, I'm 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 sort of in that camp too. I don't drink a lot of it. Yeah. <laughs> but I think if you enjoy it, that's fine. However, I think it hasn't quite made it into the cancer prevention guidelines. You know, we've got stronger evidence for things like coffee preventing liver cancer and um, womb cancer. Um, although there's suggestive data for green tea, um, I think it's not quite as strong to put it into clinical recommendations. Having said that, I think it's a really great addition to any, um, you know, healthy diet pattern. So I wouldn't have a problem with it. Now, when it comes to reversal of chronic disease, I think we all need to, to take care with using that term. And I appreciate that I have used it on my website and things. So there's, cer there's certain conditions like type 2 diabetes, where, a, where the the word remission is probably better. You know, sometimes you've already had the damage done for ye from years of insulin resistance, and maybe you can't reverse every aspect. But, you know, the current, um, you know, uh, gold standard is that if you have a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes, doctors should be helping you to put that into remission, meaning that you have normal glucose regulation and you no longer need medication. Um, and so that's kind of the approach that I think is evidence-based that uses a diet and lifestyle approach yeah. for reversing or putting things into remission. I don't believe that, you know, full bone cancer, by the time it's a clinically apparent um, uh, problem, can truly be reversed. But the data we have for cancer Cancer mainly comes from the prostate cancer um, research world and the pioneer of lifestyle medicine is a, a, a American um, physician and researcher called Dr. Dean Ornish um, and he's done a number of randomized studies on using his lifestyle approach which is a plant-based diet regular physical activity social support and um, uh, stress management so meditation and so forth and he's randomized people with early stages of prostate cancer, nearly 100 people randomized um, to his lifestyle program. And he was able to show that there was a reduction in the PSA level, so prostate specific antigen level. And after two years, that there was a impact, positive impact on outcomes. So fewer people in the intervention group had to go on and have surgery and radiotherapy compared to the group that were just carrying on their usual lifestyle. And he's also been able to show mechanisms by which that might be occurring so lengthening of the telomeres and also significant change in gene expression from prostate biopsy samples so it is plausible that early stages of prostate cancer for example where you don't need conventional treatment where you are watch and wait should be yeah. approached with a lifestyle uh, approach when when people get to me with lymphoma i don't talk to them about reversing with lifestyle i talk about the role of lifestyle medicine to improve their outcomes such as you know chemo brain you know that brain fog that people yeah. get we know yeah. physical activity is really good for that we know weight management is good we know that you know having lots of anti antioxidants from um healthy plant foods is good to cope with um chemo side effects you you put up you mentioned a term there which um always gets me slightly irritated i think not not with the the term itself because you talked about weight management but for so many in so many people in so many different professions the attitude to weight management is reduce your calories and do more exercise and as I understand it, there is absolutely no evidence to support that approach whatsoever, because it's actually it's more a question of what you eat rather than how how much you eat. Is that you're nodding? So I'm guessing yeah, it's your approach too. Yeah, I, I I think so. I mean, I, I very rarely talk about uh, you know telling people to lose weight. It's all about trying to um, uh, adopt healthy lifestyle behaviours that promote good health, and you know with that yeah. will come um, a healthier weight. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's something that all of us as um, 
uh, doctors could do better. It's a really tough topic to broach. Everyone needs an individual approach. And, um, you know, clearly that takes time often that we don't have, you know, we have a lot to get through on a cancer appointment and then coming down to sort of, yeah. you know, how you're going to make in a healthy way to just get sort of left aside and my patients only get to see a dietitian if they're losing weight they're not meeting their nutrient requirements rather than if they've got yeah. uh, if they're kind of malnourished in inverted commas because of a poor quality diet so yeah okay thank you for that um sally's just sent him in some advice for both you and me shireen she says that bancha tea or twig tea is much less bitter than green tea and it's made from the same twigs apparently so Ooh, I, I well that's good that. knowledge yeah that's good <laughs> knowledge we'll have to look that out thank you <laughs> um you mentioned there that a study into prostate cancer and of course i recognize that you're a hematologist are we making an assumption that the same approach is equally relevant to all different types of cancer or is there a specific approach to different um, beasts? No, I mean, I, I think from what we know and what we're going to know that even for rarer cancers like lymphoma, that the best approach is going to be to adopt a healthy plant-based diet and limit, uh, you know, the carcinogens in the diet as much as we can. I mean, we're only really ever going to get observational data in that setting. And actually, I've, I've written an article of, of what we know about non-Hodgkin lymphoma and the impact of diet. I'll send that to you afterwards for, for oh, your please, email you. that goes out. Um, and it's very much sort of observational data, but it's all along the same lines you're like we're never going to find a study that says eating red meat is okay for cancer so um i think the broad approach and i think it would be nice to have um studies randomized studies in each different cancer but it's just not going to happen mm. really um you know the big three um prostate, colorectal and breast cancer is where we've got the most data. And so, for example, the Women's Health Initiative study, um, you may know about this, it's the largest nutritional intervention yeah. study and the most expensive ever conducted in postmenopausal women, about 50,000 women um, followed for um, over a decade now. Um, and in that cohort, people who were eating um, a healthier diet with more fruits, vegetables and whole grains as part of the intervention group did better after a breast cancer cancer diagnosis, they lived longer and had a longer remission compared to people who were eating less of those healthy foods. So we've got a bit of supportive yeah. data from breast cancer. And of course, colorectal cancer, when you think that more than 50% of cases could be prevented, we've got that data, you know, then it makes sense that even after a diagnosis of colorectal cancer, you want to pay attention to your gut microbiome and avoid the foods that caused may have contributed to it in the first place so you want to concentrate on a yeah. fiber rich plant-based um, diet and that's also borne out in the kind of observational studies that have followed people after a diagnosis of yeah. colorectal cancer um colorectal cancer you've already mentioned is uh, is reasonably common and um and significant in in our country as as physical therapists, are there particular things that you think we might be able to pick up on very early in colorectal cancer where we think you ought to go and see somebody, not yourself because you're a haematologist, but you know, go and see a specialist? Are there warning signs that we might not have recognised otherwise? Yeah, no, I suspect you're all familiar with the common ones, but just to say those sort of things, you know, that really is early detection. It's like when you were talking about mammography or, you know, if we went yeah. down the route of PSA testing, that's early detection opposed to what we've spent our time talking about, which is um, prevention. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, colorectal cancer, it's the common things that we're all taught throughout our um, healthcare career. It's about change in bowel habit, it's abdominal pain or bloating, it's blood in the stool, um, those sort of and weight loss, those sort of things. Yeah. And of course, we have a screening program as well for age 50 and above, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Um, Sarah has asked whether copper rich foods pose a cancer risk. Hmm. Now that's interesting. Copper. I don't have. I don't know about the association with cancer, but that might be because I haven't looked into particular studies on that. So I might have to pass on that question. Uh, you, the, the person asking the question okay. might actually know a bit more. Yeah, uh, I don't think excess to copper toxicity is a is a real genuine problem in our current um, you know, dietary pattern, but again, might be wrong. Yeah, well, maybe Sarah can share um, the source of that concern and uh, help us. Now, um, 
I have interviewed a number of people about the keto diet and as I understand it the keto diet has good evidence for the fact that it is good for weight loss and it's also good for reversing type 2 diabetes. So how does that sit with your plant-based approach to nutrition? Because obviously it's, it is much 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 more difficult to follow a keto diet if you're vegetarian or vegan um, and probably if you cut out the red meats you can still do it fairly easily. But um yeah so another broad topic really and i think um you know i agree with you that um a low carbohydrate or if you go even further and very low carb and, and become ketogenic that the short term data and most of the studies are less than 2 years show that it can support weight loss if that's required and support better glucose um, regulation but longer term studies um, especially if you're doing an animal based low carb or keto diet show that for all the reasons that we know um, the long term health suffers increased cardiovascular disease because of the high levels of sat saturated fat and hence the ra rise in cholesterol that happens and significant proportion of people following this pattern of eating uh, increases your risk of cancer such as colorectal cancer and increases your risk of premature death so it's not a really a long-term solution and to be honest i could say about any sort of um uh diet pattern that reduces calorie intake and avoids processed foods would be able to lose weight and weight loss is required for type 2 diabetes reversal. So whatever, if you want to reverse or put type 2 diabetes into remission, the vast majority of people have to lose weight. The NHS has gone down the route, route of total um, uh, replacement, uh, food replacement, I think that's the right term, where they give those low calorie shakes, 800 calories a day. People who lose more than 15 kilograms, you've got a more than 80% chance of putting it into remission. If a low carb diet can help you lose weight, you will put your type 2 diabetes in remission. I would then point you to the vast amount of data supporting healthy plant-based diets, which are low in calories, high in nutrients, high fiber, protect your long-term health that also show mm. the same. So it's not, it's not like the one or the other when it comes to diabetes reversal, but I do think you need to think about your long-term health and a plant-based diet is very much embedded for cancer um, prevention guidelines. Um, so, you, you, you know, you don't need to choose what you're trying to prevent. Um, the, there is a lot of research on going ongoing on the ketogenic diet, but I've not seen any real um, human, convincing human data to suggest it's going to be a goer long term. Having said that, you can, of course, do a low carbohydrate plant-based diet if that's what you want to try. David Jenkins, um, a professor, he, he was trained in the UK but works at the Un University of Toronto. He's the chap that created the portfolio diet and also the glycemic index. He um, has pioneered randomized studies on the Eco Atkins um, diet. So it's a plant-based, vegan, low-carb diet. And yeah, for some people, having less carbohydrates, higher fat, higher protein, may work for them but I think it's the wrong approach to be um, basing a diet around your macronutrients we should just be eating foods that we know promote good health um, and that's a combination of fruits vegetables whole grains beans nuts and seeds Thank you. Um, we've only got a couple of minutes left, so I'll try and get through some of the questions. Here's one that actually relates to your own specialisation. Um, Lisa says that her niece is in remission for lymphoma after stem cell transplant and asks, do parents or grandparents' diet play a big part in this um, before conception of the child? Yeah. Um, so I think in general, we know that the diet of your grandparents can be the, the evidence of it can be shown in your genes. <laughs> um, so epigenetic changes do get transmitted through generations and therefore healthy lifestyles are so important, you know, for your future progeny, as it were. However, I've not seen that data for lymphoma, um, no, because their strength of evidence isn't there. Um, I think for um, acute lymphoblastic lymphoma, that's the only one that we really have good evidence that it starts in utero and is a, it is a combination of sort of genetics and environmental factors that occur very early in life if not kind of pre-life as it yeah. were um but i've not seen that data for for lymphoma okay we're gonna to have to wind up quite shortly but earlier on you mentioned a course um now i wasn't aware that you ran courses are your courses for all and sundry or just for medical doctors 
Yeah, so I also work one day a week at the University of Winchester, where for the last four years I've been running an online course, um, CPD accredited, um, on plant-based nutrition in kind of in clinical practice and its role in right. all the things that we're talking about today, which is disease prevention and uh, reversal remission. Yeah. Um, so um, yeah, I'll send a link to that. It's oh, thirty do, hours. Yeah. Yeah. Online. Um, it's aimed at healthcare professionals, but as you might imagine, a lot of non-healthcare professionals have taken it because it's a subject of general interest at the moment yes. in in, yeah. in 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 the country. And um, I've had great feedback from non-health professionals as well. But we're talking, you know, I'm talking to health professionals at the moment, so it would be highly appropriate for you guys if you're interested in taking that forward. No, I've, I'm not surprised you get great feedback. I'm I'm already getting great feedback from the, today's talk, and uh, it sounds to me <laughs> as though you you would run a really good course, Shireen. Uh, I'm really you. grateful for you giving up your time today, and I'm sure everybody wishes you well in in your work, which is um, you know, so important these days if it wasn't before. Anyway, thank you for that. Um, that is all we've got time for today. So I hope you found that useful, helpful and interesting. I know I certainly have.